Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. This is Dr. Mary Dozier. She's the Amy E. DuPont Chair of Child Development and Director of Research for the Early Learning Center at the University of Delaware. She developed and evaluated the Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up Program called ABC. And ABC teaches specific parenting skills to foster parents and high-risk birth parents. In rigorous studies, her program helps offset the effects of toxic stress in infants and young children. And in fact, teaching these specific skills to parents has biological impacts on the way children's bodies deal with stress. Truly amazing. ABC is listed as an outstanding program in SAMHSA's National Child Traumatic Stress Network, so that relates to our earlier question, and in California's Evidence-Based Clearinghouse for Child Welfare. Uh, Dr. Dozier has received several national awards for her research, including the Innovation Award from the National Institute of Mental Health. She's raised $22 million to support her research, published 117 scientific articles. That is also truly amazing. Uh, she's been working in this area for 22 years, which she dates back to a TV news segment. She saw on TV a child being taken away from her foster mother, and Dr. Dozier had a one-year-old son herself at the time and was struck by how terribly difficult this would be for the child who must feel toward this mother as her own son felt toward her. So the next day she went to class and talked to her students about how little we know about the process of developing a new attachment relationship with a new caregiver. And within two weeks, she changed research directions, and the rest is history. So welcome. Offsetting toxic stress by training parents of infants and young children in foster care, the ABC program operating in 11 states. Thank you so much, Karen. And wow, this is quite an audience. I'm just delighted that you all are grappling with these very important issues, and uh, I I'm, I'm appreciate your being here. What I'll be talking about is the challenges that children who have experienced early, uh, who have experienced toxic stress have in, in dealing with life. And we'll be talking about strategies that we've developed that help parents help children deal with this. And then I'll be presenting the effectiveness of our intervention. It's the, which, which button is it? Just this one. Okay, thanks. Um, Sorry. Um, so we've been developing a 10-session in-home intervention for foster parents, high-risk birth parents, pa birth parents involved with the Child Protective Services, um, and for adopted children, and have, have adapted this. And we've targeted issues that are problematic for children who have experienced toxic stress. We've, we're currently implementing this in 11 states. What you can see here, hopefully, in this picture is the parent coach surrounded by the grandmother who's the foster mom, the mom, birth mom on this side, and five children. And this is really how, how this happens. We want everybody to be there because, as you'll hear, we want behavior to change in, in the world that people live with live in. We want people to have practice changing their behaviors so that they, when we leave, there's not this big divide between what we've, we've helped them do and what their real lives are. There's three things that we focus upon that I'll take you through very quickly. We help, and what, the reason that we tar target these is because these are issues that we have identified as particularly critical for children who've experienced toxic stress. These are nurturance, following a children's lead, and avoiding intrusive behavior. I'll, I won't talk about the intrusive behavior, but I will talk about the first two. And these targets are intended to enhance attachment security, help children develop organized attachments or trusting relationships with their parents, and help children develop better regulatory capabilities, both behaviorally and biologically. Now, for this first target, nurturance, we know that nurturance is critical for children who have experienced early adversity or toxic stress. If they don't have nurturing caregivers, what we see is they're at risk for developing what's known as a disorganized attachment. They're, they, they're ability to rely upon their caregiver breaks, breaks down, and this is predictive of later long-term problems. So that's why we focus on nurturance. 
Now we know that there's, we, ha we have found through our work and other people as well that two things can get in the way of parents nurturing their, their children. One is that the child may push the caregiver away, and I'm gonna show you evidence of this, or behavioral, uh, anecdotal evidence, uh, but we have seen this in terms of our research over time. And the second is that it may not come naturally to parents. And you know parents who just aren't very comfortable. They say, oh, you, you know, you're okay, don't cry. That works okay for low-risk parents, to be honest. Our, our kids can do okay with that. But this, is, this doesn't work okay for children in foster care and children who are living with maltreating parents. And so they, they need parents to overcome that. So I wanna show you first a child who is not pushing his mom away. This is not a child in foster care. This is a child living with his low-risk middle-class birth mom. And what you can see here is that he uh, is playing by himself in his mom's absence for a period of three minutes, and it, he's sort of listless in his play. His mom comes back in. And what's neat about that is you can just imagine how easy that mom's job is. You know, it just feels good to, to nurture that child. What you'll see in the next is a child for whom that's not the case. This is a child where the child turns away when the mom comes in, or at least shows little interest. Did you hear what the, the mom said? Um, you can turn it down, thanks. The, the mom said, you don't care, you don't care about mommy. Now that's very rare that a mom's actually gonna say that, but what happens to, I think, almost any mom is that it hurts when a child doesn't turn to you. It doesn't seem like, like the child needs you. And foster moms who, as we've talked about, are very well-intentioned and are volunteers have this child who doesn't seem to need them and that they can't or that they can't soothe and so what we need to do is help that mom provide nurturance even though the child doesn't elicit it and as I said even though it may not come naturally to the mom and I'll show you an example of how we do this we do this through um, we have a manualized curriculum but we also do this through in the moment comments where we comment as the behavior is occurring and support that behavior let's see oh I'm sorry I just said all of that. Um, so, so what we find is this pushing away really elicits moms acting like they don't care. And so our first target is to provide nurturing care even when children don't elicit it. And here you can see us doing this on the porch. This is a birth mom. I'll be showing you some videos of birth moms, some of, of foster moms. Okay, that's, that's an example of how we support nurturance. We actually, in a very probably nerdy way, we have quantified how one makes comments. And we, what we do is we take five minutes from everybody's intervention. Is there reverberation? Do I need to do it? Okay. Um, we take five minutes from every session. And for people who are doing this in Idaho or in Kansas and Minnesota and wherever else, and we, we um, count how many of these behaviors happen in this five minute minute period and the level at which they're happening and then we give feedback to them and they have to meet criteria in terms of how frequent and the level and so forth. So it's a, you know, it's, it may seem very touchy-feely but the nice thing is that we can, we can quantify it and we can let people know, we can know when they're doing it as intended. So that's our first intervention component is nurturance. The second is following the child's lead. And the reason that following the lead is important is because children who have experienced toxic stress, as I've mentioned before, also have problems regulating 
behavior and physiology. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about problems regulating physiology right now. There's a lot of evidence that this HPA system that you may have heard of when you were here for the, the brain development symposium a year ago, but the HPA system, or the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, is very susceptible to the effects of stress. And we, this HPA axis ends up, when, when experiencing stress, secreting cortisol, which is an end product of this, of this system. And I'm sorry, I'm going, going to go very fast through this just in the interest of time. But there's two functions, and both of these functions are at some point in development very much affected by toxic stress. There's a stress reactive function, and there's a diurnal function. The diurnal function is um, cortisol helps us get up in the morning. We have higher levels of cortisol in the morning, low levels of night at night. It's not that we're more stressed in the morning, you may or may not be, but it's just that this is, this is part of the, the, the way the body functions to help us be diurnal creatures, be up in the morning. So it's, as my colleague that works with Patty says, this is like your body's cup of coffee that um, ha getting you up in the morning. But it also helps you, the low levels at night is what helps you sleep. And so jet lag is partially accounted for problems adjusting to a different diurnal rhythm and so forth. So we look at this at wake up and at bedtime because what we ran into in our work and in, again, Patty's colleague Phil Fisher's work is that this is disrupted by the effects of early adversity or toxic stress. What we find among kids like ours, low risk kids, is that you should have, and us as adults, you see this all the way from about six months of age all the way through the lifespan, a high morning value of cortisol and a low evening value, as you can see here. What you see among foster children is a flatter slope. So adversity disrupts this diurnal function so that it's a, it's a lower morning value. And then among children living with their neglecting birth parents, you see even a flatter slope. So foster families, even without any intervention, help to regulate this. It's it, better than a, being in a neg neglecting family, but it still is not what you would see among low risk. So that, that took us to, boy, how do, we, how do we help children get better biological regulation? And we, where we arrived with this is, helping parents follow children's lead, but it, it, was, it was somewhat of an intuitive leap, I think. But we, there's also lots of evidence, as Patty has talked about, that children have difficulties regulating behavior and also regulating emotions if they've experienced early adversity. So we really wanted to help with, with all of those issues of regulation. And what we did is we looked in the literature to see what what is it that can help a child develop better regulation? And we didn't, there weren't randomized clinical trials that told us this, but there was developmental literature that told us that when parents were very responsive, when they followed their child's lead or were uh, contingent in their responsiveness, then children were more likely to develop better regulatory capabilities. So that's why we built this into our intervention. And I wanna show you, this is a very dark video here, but it's so good that it's worth, I, I really hope you can see it. This is a mom who, this is what I mean by following the lead. She is, is if she's yoked to this child, she just follows so well. Oh good, that's not too bad. see smiles, so I, I assume you could see that. It's really just a lovely thing. And what, what, if you think about it, because I think it is a leap to think of how this could help develop regulatory capabilities, but it's so smooth for the infant. For the, the infant and the young child, the mom is the, or the, the parent is the main interactive partner. That's where, where these brain connections, why these brain connections are developing as they are, is primarily from, from the interactive partner. And this is, these, this is a real smooth interaction versus the mom who corrects or changes or squeaks the toy in her face or whatever else. And this is how we support this in the intervention. <laughs>
So you can see that the mom is follow the foster mom in this case is following the lead and the parent coach is almost like a cheerleader. She's pointing out what she's doing and how she's doing it. So we looked at the effectiveness of this intervention and I'm talking about this intervention but we've had several randomized clinical trials with neglecting parents, with foster parents, now with foster toddlers and with children adopted internationally and I'm going to present data from all of those randomized clinical trials rather than, so, so you can ask me if you want to know specifically what, they're, what it's regarding. But we looked at attachment in what's known as a strange situation, so the child separated from the parent and then reunited, and we code attachment behavior in that. We look at emotion expression in a uh, challenging task where the child is frustrated. We look at uh, mom's brain activity, we look at cortisol production. And first, with regard to attachment, what we find is that in our, and we've randomly assigned, so we've got the same group of say 120 and we've randomly assigned 60 to one intervention condition, 60 to another. The, in the control intervention, those parents get an intervention of the same length, the same duration in their homes and so forth as the ABC. It just doesn't concern the same targets. And what we see in the ABC, the Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up Intervention, is we see 32% of those children developing disorganized attachments as contrasted with 57% disorganized attachments in the control intervention. Now, 32% is higher than, say, our kids would be. Our kids would be maybe between 15 and 20% of low-risk children would be disorganized. So we'd, we'd love to see better than that, but it, it still is a a pretty huge Im improvement over, over what you would see otherwise. These are, these are children between about 12 and 24 months when we're assessing them. Now this is just to remind you what kids look like in terms of cortisol. We don't want to see this flat slope. We want to see a steeper slope. And so that's what we're looking at with ABC versus the control intervention. And that's exactly what we see. We see the, the red line is the uh, control intervention, and that's very flat across the day. Our, the blue solid line is our ABC intervention shortly after the intervention, within a couple of months of the intervention. So we're seeing a steeper slope and higher morning value, so change in cortisol production, so change in this biological marker. I think what's even more exciting probably is that dashed line refers to data that were collected when the child was five years old, so three years after the intervention. And we still see the, the dotted uh, blue line is the ABC, and what you can see, see is still a significantly steeper slope and higher morning value for the ABC than the DEF. So we're seeing sustained effects in, in biological outcomes. Thank you. Now, this is, has been referred to, Mark referred to this part of the brain, the, the prefrontal cortex that develops from early infancy on through, through the 20s, through the mid-20s. And this is such a key, key to um, successful outcomes, especially for kids that have experienced adversity. Because this is the, the part of the brain, as Mark already talked about, that is involved in making decisions about um, do I take this drug or do I not? Do I go along with my friends and, and rob that lady or do I not? So the prefrontal cortex is just, just really very important and involved in executive functioning. So what we were interested in is a number of executive functioning uh, tasks here. And you can think of executive functioning as, as covering those sorts of things where you're making a decision, you're planning, you're figuring out whether you should do something or not, you're stopping something that you've already done, you're shifting sets. And in this case, it's a shifting sets, changing, you, you, you learn one thing and then you've got to learn another rule, how well can you do it? In this case, what we know is that three-year-olds can't do this task whereas, um, and ADH, kids with attention deficit disorder can't do this test very well. Um, and this is, 
I'm showing you here right now the pre-switch data. So I've asked kids to sort things by shape and they, everybody does fine. All of our, our low-risk kids and our ABC kids and our DEF kids, our control kids. What's different is once you tell them, okay, don't shape by color anymore, I want you, whichever one I said, don't shape by color, now, shape, now uh, sort by, by shape. So you're not gonna put the red ones together, you're gonna put the boats together and the bunnies together. And this is where, this is the executive functioning, is once you, you switch. And what we see here is pretty striking, that our low-risk kids and our ABC kids, the, the blue and the green bars, they're able to do it. Who can't do it is our control group, the, the group that was in this DEF uh, condition. So this is an example, and this is with foster children. This is, what's, what's compelling here is that you're seeing this 10 session in-home intervention having effects on perhaps this, this ability to make, uh, to make good decisions, these executive functionings executive functions. Um, I'm just going to mention this very quickly. Uh, a graduate student did, did this task, uh, Kristen Bernard, with, and she put electrodes on, on mom's heads and looked to see whether they could differentiate. They could, all, all of them say this is a laughing baby, that's a, a neutral baby, and that's a crying baby. Everybody can see it. But what we know about neglecting moms is that they, their brain activity doesn't differentiate those three, those three faces. And we knew that from somebody else's work. And what we found that was just surprising to me, to be honest, is that our ABC mom's brain activity did differentiate, but the moms in the control group didn't. And so, again, three years after the intervention, there's something different in these moms' brains because, um, you know, that, that in turn, that, reflects their responsiveness to uh, children's faces. So that, you know, you, we're looking for mechanisms and, you know, one of those things is what, how do you respond to a child's distress? How do you respond when a child needs you to follow their lead? Uh, and one more outcome slide, and this, I, again, I, I know I'm throwing a lot of data at you, that telomeres are the protective ends of chromosomes. And this is something that is no, we know that toxic stress affects health outcomes. We know it affects telomere length. And every time uh, there's the DNA replicates, the, the telomere gets shorter. And what, what we know, again, high risk is re associated with shorter telomeres and eventually with senescence of, the, of this. But what we see with ABC is that we see longer telomere length than with the DEF intervention group. This one, probably, that one probably surprises me more than, more than anything. This is among children adopted internationally, so I cannot say yet that, that, that we would see that among foster kids as well. And uh, I just want to, to mention here, I'm gonna show you a birth parent now we create montages at the end of this 10 session intervention where we bring together videos of the, them following their child's lead and being nurturing. And I'm gonna show you part of that montage. Um, I, what I wanna tell you about this mom is that when we first walked into her home, her child was so, looked so depressed. The child did not move. The mom would try to lift the child's hand and put it on the toy. Mom was, didn't really know how to interact with, to, with the child very well at all. Um, and this was reflected in both the mom's behavior and the child's. So I wanna show you what, what this, um, show you this montage we created at the end. Do you mind starting at the beginning? Yeah, sorry. Just for that, thanks. I don't fucking love you. Just more human thumbs and tell me that's all. See how it sparkles in my eyes. If I couldn't hide it if I tried, that's right. I don't love you much, do I? Just more anything else in this whole world. Well, I don't Just more than all the stars. Forward 
if you want. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. That's perfect. So to end on a very touchy-feely note, um, the, now we, we are, I think I've mentioned, we are implementing this in a number of states, and I think the, what's critical, what we have learned that has been critical for us is that in moving something from the university-based intervention out into the community, it is just critical that you have a way to be able to monitor fidelity and not just monitor fidelity, but really have a mechanism for making sure that, that the intervention is implemented uh, as intended. And I think the most exciting thing for us is being able to quantify what it is that we're doing. We can really see whether people are doing it or not, provide feedback to them with regard to that, and then improve their, their capacity for implementing it with fidelity. I think that's, um, uh, the, just as a reminder, we're targeting the effects of toxic stress. We see impacts on behavior and physiology. The effects are enduring, at least for three or four years. We now have a, we're, we're funded to look at these children that we intervened with in infancy. We're looking at these kids in, at eight, nine, and 10 in a variety of tasks, uh, peer relations, emotion regulation, um, and uh, inhibitory control and things like that. And this is, this is family-based, implemented in several, in a number of states. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>